Hi, this is Catherine M. Davis with Artbeat Santa Fe, and I'm very happy to be here with Shane Tolbert, the painter whose work you see behind us. And we're at David Richard Gallery. Um, this exhibition um, includes works by Christopher Benedict, Gregory Botts, Stephen Hayes, Forrest Moses, and of course Shane. The title of the exhibition is Earthscapes, Contemporary Views of and From the Land. So welcome, Shane. It's Thanks. good to have you here on Artbeat. It's it's great to be here, Catherine. Yeah. And you know, you just named off this awesome group show. It's good company to be in. It's it is. It's nice company. And I just wanted to mention that um, you are on the cover. You're the featured artist on the cover of the June issue of V Magazine. Um, we'll talk uh, just so that people have something that they can go to and maybe read about your work if they haven't gotten to know it yet. Um, one of the first things I wanted to talk to you about came out of this interview. I learned um, from your interviewer, Chelsea Weathers. Yes, yes. That you, um, the, you're very process oriented. Your work is very much about process. And because of toxicity, you use acrylic paint. That's correct. I, yeah, and, and um, I, that's correct. I started out with bleach, and I'm a project-based painter. In addition, it's, it's a mouthful. In addition to process-based. So, you know, I've worked with plaster, oil, um, but what I've landed on for this recent body of work for the past five years has been acrylic. Acrylic. So how does the process come into that working? You, you mentioned in the interview working with acrylic and having it, not trying to make it do something the else. oil painting. Yeah. Um, so what's really compelling to me is appreciating a medium. Um, for what it is. For what it is. So this idea of truth and materials. Right. Um, and it was a long process of things just kind of opening up for me. And it just started in Montauk when I was doing my Edward Albee residency. Uh -huh. And um, I was using acrylic paint against plastic sheeting. And right. it just created a really unique surface that a brush stroke um, could never make on so its own. So your work is gestural, but the gesture is not necessarily of your hand. Correct. Um, uh, Chelsea shaped the language really well in our, our conversation. So she did. Yeah. This idea of chance operations right. is is really fundamental to my practice. So I like establishing rules to a game and then letting them play out, and that's how the image is formed. I read about that in the interview. We, we left off talking about this idea of chance that um, Chelsea. Uh, Weathers brought up in her interview with you um, in your feature article on the June issue of the magazine. Um, chance is definitely a nice way of putting it. And when I was looking earlier today, I, I reviewed the work of Elio Otisica because while I've studied him and would like to say, of course I remember who he is, I yeah. couldn't remember. So I looked. Beautiful work, you guys. Look it up. Um, but the work has a lot of elements of it. it's blocks of color and also I think the void is very important in Otisika's work as is your it is in yours and it reminded me a little bit of Hans Arp's um, paintings that were supposedly created by chance can you speak to that and those influences well I'm a big fan of Arp um, and you know a, lo a lot of those were collage elements that were dropped to form exactly. images um, which I think is a very special way to formalize an image. Um, and it's an important break, especially for me, um, when I really committed myself early on to abstraction was this idea of removing yourself from traditional narrative structures. Right. Um, and with Alio, the beautiful thing is his uh, chromiographics, uh -huh. where he would just work with um, large sheets of fabric and performances. Right. And I think that, um, that's just what really brought me in. Like I love Brazilian concrete art, but the per yeah. but the performance yeah. works is where what really captured my attention uh -huh. and made me think about how I can even in terms of painting create movement right. in a really fascinating way. Right. One of the things that um, David Eichholz, who right now is at the New York Gallery, um, wanted us to consider. Um, in our interview with you is that you s state that your 
influenced by the color field painters, which I think is fairly obvious. I can, yeah. see, you know, I can see Helen Frankenthaler in there. Um, and also the minimalist. I can definitely see that in the grid. But sure, talk about that, please. You, um, I think it, it's better to come from you than me speculating just on what I see. I see both of them very clearly. How did they come together for you? Well, that, that's a great question. Um, for me, a lot of this merges uh, whenever I had to insert content into the work. So, um, What might that content be and why did you have to insert it? Yeah, the, the content for me and what's interesting to me to speak to is life in ABIQ and okay. like geological formations and trying to understand like my place in this deep geological time. And that beautiful quote from you, what was it? Um, 10,000 years of moonlight on a rock. Yes. That's what he's thinking about in Abiquiu, which is where um, you work for the uh, Ghost Ranch. That's where Georgia O'Keeffe lived and worked. Yeah, it's special to have a, a reason to be out there uh, and a way to keep me out there. Um, but it's it's the poetics of the space. It's, yeah. it's a way of... It's, and it's a joy of abstraction. You know, there are artists like Ann Truitt that are really important to me. Mm -hmm. um, but being able to consider an idea that isn't readily accessible, um, how do you define things like radiating heat of 10,000 years of moonlight on a rock? You know, it's like, the, it's not visible. Oh, I love that, yeah. yeah. But I love that that's a consideration. In the interview also, you mentioned that you sat down one time and tried to write out the rules for what yes. a painting is. Yeah. Um, what conclusion did you come to? Or yeah, do well, you still go back to that and wonder? I do, I do. Um, when I was in grad school was when I had to start asking serious questions about what well, yeah. painting is. Uh -huh. And um, that's when I started my reductive practice of working with bleach. So I made a very important list, or excuse me, let me back that up. I made a decision to start like writing down what are these rules of painting and right. step one through 20, everything is this additive process. And dealing with game theory, I thought, well, what if I reorient all of these rules? So I had the list and then I erased all the numbers on the left side and started repositioning the numbers and then considering how I can go from three to seven, back to one to eight. Uh, I like and th that. And that's when things opened up for me. Okay, what I'm thinking of right now, um, because I'm teaching an art history class and we just covered this, I'm thinking about Rauschenberg erasing a Willem de Kooning. Yes. I'm thinking about um, you know, he and John's just using things in their art that were um, never considered to be art materials before. Yeah. And how important it is for artists to set some kind of limitations or boundaries so that you can find out how it is to work around that. Yeah. Well, you know, Rauschenberg, who's also a Texas artist. Yeah, born and you're in, from Houston. Yeah, he, he grew up just outside of Houston. Right. Um, but the combines that you speak of are immense. Killer. And then, you know, his early work, all of it came from necessity. Like, he would right. go to the Lower East Side and just buy random cans of paint without knowing what the colors even were. And then, you know, that's a chance operation in itself. Right. Uh, and, and then have to form an image, a compelling image, out of all these materials. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I do see a thread coming from Rauschenberg and Johns um, through the Latin American modernist and the, the color, obviously the color field and the minimalist. Yeah. But I also wanted to ask you about um, has, I think I might suspect the answer here, but I'd like for you to elaborate on it. How has living in Abiquiu, which you've done for almost two years now, yes. how has that changed, say, the palette of your work, the texture of your work, the form and content of your work? Um, you know, when, when I moved to Abiquiu, I didn't have any real interest in geology. Um, mm -hmm. It's something I that, understand that surprised me. Right. Um, and, you know, being in this vast space, which essentially before, bef before continents reformed, before there was multiple continents, when it was just Pangaea, right. Abiquiu was on the coast, the west coast of this supercontinent. 
Um, and even in that shuffle and that reformation over hundreds of millions of years, there's this like vast ancient seabed. And, and you can see it whenever you're just like looking to Paternal across the valley from Ghost Ranch. Um, and it, I mean, it's, it's visible. Like you can imagine yourself standing on a cliff over an ocean. Absolutely, I know that, that view that you're talking about. And the Paternal was the mountain that Georgia O'Keeffe felt that if she painted it enough, God told her it would be her mountain. I, and I think her count was 29 times. Not bad. Uh, not bad, that's <laughs> remarkable. Um, but time out there, um, time, just, just time, like living, living in that space through the seasons, um, uninterrupted sight lines, the vastness of it, the scale of it. I think yeah. re, it, it reformed my perspective on, on thinking through these things. So, and how did it affect the way that you arrange space or the void on your canvases? Well, the drama is elevated. Um, uh -huh. You know, for me, it's it's these bigger epics, larger stories to share. Mm -hmm. You know, it the scale of everything changed. My perspective changed with it, and that's one thing that really opened up for me. Where previously, like living in an urban center, you're you're really in this grid structure. So right. you have narrow sight lines, you have limited views, and just being able to see such. So much open space changes everything. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you refer to these uh, round, these orbs or disc shapes as moons. And I take from the article that you go on night hikes and where the moon has its own presence. Um, tell us about how you, how you feel about them, how you paint them, all of it. Well, it's, it just started as uh, formal exercises. Uh, it didn't How even, do you paint a circle? Yeah, and, and it didn't even really shape itself as a moon. Um, I, I do speak of them as moons, as disks, mm -hmm. um, just for descriptive language. But it was those night hikes up Chimney Rock that really shaped the way I started considering everything uh, and created interest because I'm so used to light, the, the light pollution of daily life oh, kind of yeah. creates this uh, monotony in terms of like nightlife, like it's just a haze, this like weird right. purple, lavender sky. But living out here, you're much more aware of cycles every month. And you know, like my sleep diminishes as the moon gets full, like mm -hmm. I can just tell from like, a deep sleep to a light sleep because I'm light sensitive. And as I just became attentive, as I became aware of it, I started spending more time outside at night mm -hmm. um, due to restlessness, essentially. Right. And that's when I started going on these hikes and to make this time productive, uh, it just was absorbed into my studio practice. Mm -hmm. Now you used to um, place plastic sheets, maybe of mylar, um, on wet paint to form um, images? Do, how yeah. are you doing it now? Are you actually directly applying the, the color, the pigment to the prepared surface? How are you Yeah, so there's, there's, there's a lot of different, over the past couple of years, I've developed a lot of different approaches to mm -hmm. working with plastic sheeting and acrylic paint. Um, but it started out with me simply blotting like yeah. like a Warhol blot and right. just pressing um, plastic sheeting on top of that and then it dries through the back and then I peel back the plastic sheeting and the texture of the surface holds the language of the plastic sheeting. I but definitely like, still see that language. Yeah, in, yeah. and in Paloma, um, this big, almost like a cock, the what's left of a cocktail on a on a napkin is just what's been stained and applied to the plastic sheeting, that's dried, and then I've applied that in, in its entirety to canvas. So all the white around the edges is me blotting, but uh, the stain in the disc is just applied to the plastic sheeting, and then it dries, and then I apply that to canvas. It's really a, a lovely piece. It's really spectacular. Thank um, you. Yeah. I'm pretty drawn into that. And for those of you who can't see it, you need to come see this work 
in person at yes, the Richard Gallery right? in Santa Fe on Pacheco. Um, because you can't see, um, probably from images, that the whole surface is involved in the, the making of the painting. Yeah. The whole process is involved. And they're very textural looking. I really am trying hard not to just touch. <laughs> um, so talk to us about a dimensionality and this sense of texture. I, again, I can see um, Otisica with the use of uh, fabrics, yeah. your use of plastic sheeting. Yeah. Well, and, and that language comes out of a long-standing interest in post-minimalism, um, mm -hmm. art making, and mm -hmm. my time as an art handler gave me a lot of exposure right. To, right. to these artists, uh, well, to their work up close. Um, right. You got to see the backs of paintings. You got to see how the artists made things. And for another artist, yeah. that's really important. Yeah, to find out. or how radical a surface is, because like even right. documentation flattens and flattens a work out in a way that you never could interpret it if you didn't see it in person. Like you right. just couldn't understand it. Uh, raking light, things like that, seeing right. it in time. So you know, going into that process, building up uh, a substantial surface was really important to me but in a way that I removed my hand from the work. I know, there's such an interesting, um, um, the access of the hand is hinted at it, the access of the gesture, and then also the absence of it. Having yeah. it been removed creates a very intriguing um, and compelling tension in your work. Thank and you. I'm, I'm really happy for you and proud of you. And we are going to go ahead and close the interview. Are there any Last words from Shane Tolbert that you would like to end the interview with? Um, I, all, you know, all I'd say is first, thank you for oh, inviting me uh, for the interview. And just life in New Mexico has changed my work in unexpected ways. Absolutely. That's why artists come here. Thank you so much, Shane. Thank you. It's so good to have you. This is Catherine M. Davis for Artbeat Santa Fe signing off.